Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you. My name is Monique, and I am an alcoholic. I have alcoholism right now, right this second. What does that mean? While the speaker or the while we're talking about the how it works, the mind is telling me you're not going to be able to do this. You're not good at this. What are you doing? I'm ha- that's alcoholism for me right now. Okay, it's active in my life, and I need a power greater than myself to restore me back. So in that moment, when I hear the voice, right, it's a, it's a mind power disease. It talks to me in my own voice. It sounds just like me. And most of the time when it does talk, it's not talking very nice. I don't know if you've experienced that. I don't know if you have what I have, but I have what they call is alcoholism. And it's always talking to me. I'm not good enough I'm, or I'm better than, less than. And in those moments, I got to keep asking, God, help me be with you. God never leaves me. Whatever that God is to you, whatever Buddha, whatever power, whatever you believe. My sober date is April 15th, 2009. Um, I grew up in a small town in Bayville. My mom is actually originally from Brighton. And all my family is over, on my mom's side is over in England. Um, so, uh, my mom passed away seven years ago, but all her family's still over there. So I grew up in a chaotic family. My parents do not drink, but I had dis-ease growing up. A lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of cursing, a lot of fighting. My dad is a, an Italian Catholic and he met my fa- my mom. She was coming in from England to be a nanny. And he met her at Grand Central Station, and he tried to sell her uh, a gym t- gym membership. She was all of ninety pounds, and really, from the beginning of that relationship, it was a nightmare. Um, my mom had nobody; she only knew him, and uh, so she had begun this relationship with him, and she was now going to get get married to him. And prior to her getting married, she said, I'm going to go and surprise him uh, where he is. He was a band member. He played the saxophone. I'm going to go surprise him. Well, she got a surprise and he was, you know, cheating from the beginning. But my mom had nothing and no one here. So she latched on, you know, and that's kind of what I did when I when when I, I had a lot of victims. And you'll hear my story as many victims have I had because I was insecure and I just latched on to the first person that would like me. And my mom was, uh, you know, she had depression, uh, which we didn't really know at the time what that really was. So um, when I was a kid, I would just remember, like I said, the constant yelling and screaming. And my father was never physical, but what he would do is he would take the plates in the in the kitchen and he would take each plate and he would say, "Okay, somebody better tell me who did it. And he would start throwing the plates down and breaking the plates. You know, something happened. And I'd always be the one. I did it. Right. I always, I did it. And one time he's like, I went to put my hand up. He's like, Monique, put your hand down. I know you didn't do it because I just wanted the, the quiet. I just wanted that, 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 that to stop. So I would just say I did it. I have two brothers and two sisters. And uh, my father was an amateur boxer. So sometimes we would go at it as kids, man. We would fight. I just remember fighting with my sister and, uh, I mean, physically fight. My father taught us. He said, look, you got to learn how to fight. And when you do that, make sure when you're talking to somebody and you think that might, something might happen, like a confrontation, just talk to them and make sure your hands are up. Because if your hands are up, you can cold cock them. Right. That's the way he would. That's the way, you know, just make sure that you got your hands up, talk to them like that. So I, I was brought up to to, OK, I, I got to fight my way through things. Um, you know, nobody's going to listen to me and I'm not good enough. Whatever. I had a lot of fear 
a lot of fear from the from a, a very young age. I would look underneath my bed. I'd be like, "What the heck, son? Oh, oh, there's something underneath my bed." I would go around the house and shut all the doors and shut all the windows and make sure everything is locked. I was so scared, man. And it says in our book, fear is the number one. It's a corroding thread. And I've had it since I was a child. And I don't know where I got it. But I do know where I got it because thank God for inventory and thank God for sponsorship. Because as I did my inventory, I remember my father, again, Italian Catholic, I'll keep saying that. Maybe you'll get it later on what I mean. But um, he'd be like, watch out on the bicycle. Don't climb the tree. What are you doing? You know, he was always, I was, it was always afraid of everything. And I remember I was coming to England for my, my grandmother's 90th birthday. And he's like, Poppy, Poppy, don't forget your rosary beads. I'm like, why, Dad? Why? He goes, just in case the plane goes down. I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. Fan and now I'm like, do I got the rosary beads? Did I bring them? Are they in the suitcase? Are they not in the suitcase? What if I don't have the rosary beads? What's going to happen? And so that's kind of how I, I grew up, like this fear and this fear of this God, of my father's understanding, you know? of my father's understanding. And, and sometimes I would, I would be like, yeah, I, I get what you mean about that God. But when that, when I would hear about that God and that no matter what I did, no matter if I, if I, if I went to confession and if I, if I prayed right, and if I, you know, may, maybe I would be forgiven, but not the way I felt. I didn't think I was ever forgiven. And even going to confession, man, I go into the confessional and the priest would be like, say, five Hail Marys and three Our Father. And I go out of there. Did he say two Hail Marys, five Our Fathers? What if I don't say it right? What's going to happen? You know, so that's where my mind was. Like, I, I just thought that I had to do something. I had to do it a specific way in order to be forgiven and in order to be loved by this God that I, that I didn't understand. But for me, all, I had the I had the gift of the seeking, the always wanting to know what is this God? Like, like, what is this? I'd always ask my, my dad and my mom, I would always question about this God, you know, Oh, my dad be like, you have so many questions. You should have been a lawyer. And I'm like, I just wanted to know what this God was, you know, I didn't know. Um, so I grew up, like I said, two brothers and two sisters and, um, you know, going to high school and at middle school and, you know, at this time, my mom had started to have an affair, and um, she had a 10-year affair with this guy. And I don't know if you guys have the telephones way back when, when the telephone cord stretched all the way from one end to the other. So you knew my mom was, you know, in the bathroom on the phone with the, with this guy. So we knew as a kid something was going on, but really weren't sure. So one day she said, um, she took us to a local store and she said, look, um, I'm going to leave your father, but I'm not going to tell him. I'm telling him I'm going to go see Claire in New York. So just go along with it, okay? Secrets keep you sick. So as a little kid, I had to keep that secret. I had to go back and pretend like, oh, my mom's going to go see her friend Claire. But I knew my mom's going and she's not coming back. And I had to keep that secret. And they keep you sick, these secrets. So my mom, uh, you know, had left. And my father was was a mess. And I was in school and I was a mess and trying to figure out my life and who I was and getting into fights. And I just remember um, my friend, who was a really close friend of mine, we were in wood shop and some kids were throwing, you know, wood chip chicks chips at them and they kept throwing wood chip chips and I, and so uh I went up to the kid that tried it was showing up throwing these chips at him and uh somehow we, I was in a confrontation and the and the teacher was you know holding us back and holding the kid back and I said now's the time to cold cock him so I uh, the, the kid's getting held back I cold cock him and uh and then I leave the you know the uh, classroom and then I see my friend like the next period he's got a black eye I'm like, what happened? He goes, Johnny, the one you hit, he beat me up and he's coming after you. I'm like, he's coming after me. That day I quit school. I'm like, I'm out of here. I quit. 
can't do it. I'm afraid. So I quit school and um, got some odd jobs. You know, didn't. Uh, and mind you, at this time, see, this is how powerful, powerful and cunning and baffling this disease is. It waits. It waits. I wasn't drinking. I didn't really actually like drinking. As a matter of fact, when my friends would drink and drug, I would be like their entertainment. We'd be on the merry-go-round. I'd be singing. They'd be getting stoned, getting drunk, and I didn't drink. Until one night, um, I went to a, a, a park with two guys, and uh, I drank Mad Dog. I had a couple sips of Mad Dog. All I remember, I'm in the park, take a couple sips, and now all of a sudden I'm in my bathroom. My father's holding my head, and I'm vomiting. I'm like... What transpired between the park and the, I don't, and they told me that's called a blackout. And that's how I drank from that moment, blackout. And my father, he'd be like, what were you doing with those guys in the park? You know, he wasn't, he wasn't concerned about me drunk. He was like, he was concerned, you know, they could have done this, they could have done that. And they could have done that because I was in a blackout. I didn't know. What do I know? Anyway, so. You know, it talks about in our in our book that um, we have to find a power greater than ourselves. And as I said, as a child, I had always been trying to find this power. Where is this power? Where is this power hiding? It's under the bed. Is the power right beside me? Is the power in my you know little red wagon? Where's the power? How do I get the power? And the power is within that I hear about in the rooms, right? The power is in the rooms. Something made me, something made me go, something, I didn't believe that alcohol can kill people. I didn't, I was like, when they told me alcohol can kill, I was like, what are you talking about? I never, ever, ever heard that. Never thought it could. And when I was uh, sober, when I first got sober, a couple of people died of alcoholism, which I never knew. But anyway, um, so I didn't believe that alcohol could kill. I just, I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And so anyway, as I said, my, my, my drinking started off slow. I didn't, I did. And then from 16, when I first got drunk, I didn't pick up until fast forward till at least my late twenties. Okay. I would drink here and there, but it wouldn't, it didn't take off. It, it, I don't know why it, it's a disease uh, that, that waits sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, just like the program, the, the way we work it. It's either sometimes quickly or sometimes slowly. That's what this disease could do. Some people, it automatically gets a, a phenomenon of craving. They're in jail. They're in institutions, rehab. Some people that happens automatically for me, that didn't happen right away. It took a long, it took a long time until it was, I, until it, I was in my twenties when I was trying to figure out my sexuality. I'm in my twenties. I don't know, you know, oh my gosh, what if I'm gay? I'm going to get, I'm going to go to hell because God, you know, because gay people go to hell, um, you know, because they're gay. And, and I'm like, oh, what, what? And, and so I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I should just say I'm bisexual. Maybe God's like, okay, well, bisexual is better than being, being gay. Uh, you know, I'm like, um, okay, so I'm struggling with this. I don't know. I got this whole idea of what God is because I'm living in what my father believes. And I'm, and I'm, oh my gosh, I got to say the Hail Mary and the Our Father. I got to go to confession. Got to get, got to take the, got to do the Eucharist. And look, I don't mean any offense by, by any means to anybody that's Catholic. I'm just sharing my experience. It's only my experience. And, and I really, truly thought I was doomed. You know, I was like, no matter what I did, I was doomed. And I was like, and, and I'll be quite honest with you. Sometimes today when I have my old idea and it talks about in our book, we have to have a new experience. God help me set aside everything I think I know about people, places, things, religion, success, failure, life, death. Re uh, we gotta, I have to have a new experience every day. Let me set aside my old beliefs, my old prejudice. Sometimes that old prejudice will bring me back, right? So anyway, so um, I'm struggling with my sexuality. All of a sudden, 
I'm like going to these bars, you know, and I can't, I can't, I, f I can't feel comfortable in my own skin. I mean, I always felt like the ugly duckling. I don't know if anybody ever read the book, the ugly duckling. Well, that's how I felt. And, um, I, I don't feel comfortable in my own skin. So what do I do when I go to a bar? Bam. I go right to the bar, right to the bar because all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. And again, suddenly talks about in our book suddenly there wasn't a cloud in the sky and then i take that drink and all of a sudden everything changes now i feel pretty i feel pretty oh so pretty and then I, everything i just feel like something like wow what is this this is pretty good stuff even though i didn't like the taste of it i just like what it did right and then slowly but truly i would start i would start drinking and drinking and drinking I don't like to take too many, too long of uh, uh, drunk logs, but I just want to kind of show you some the, the progression and 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 how slow and patient it waits. And remind and remember that alcohol. I have alcoholism, right? It's um, fault finding, never satisfied, always in a hurry, and it doesn't like the word no. That's what I have is alcoholism. Okay. I have it so bad that if I want to go, all right, I'll give you a great example. This is my alcoholism. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get my house new vinyl siding on my house. I get the new vinyl siding. I'm like, damn, that color. Shit, I should have went the other, with the other color. Oh, that color doesn't look right. Or maybe I should have went with the shingles. Why didn't the sh Oh, I could have. I should have went with this instead of that. This is the mind. This is the mind power disease I have. Fault finding no matter what I do. So I need a power to recognize, awakening, awareness. We're all right here, right now. In this moment, every single one of us have currently had a spiritual awakening. Why? Because you're in this room right now. It's a spiritual awakening because you're not out there drinking. That's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. We're alcoholics. We should be at a bar somewhere, or maybe isolated in a home drinking. But some, some power some power that each of us have and you may call it god you may call it jesus you may call it buddha you may call it higher power. i don't care what you call it just call it there is one who has all power that one is god whatever or higher power may you find him now it now the now because again may you find him now i'm like him why does it gotta be a him how come it can't be a her what if it's black what if it's white why can't it be what it wanted to be well it can because guess what? They told me when I came into AA, two things I thought would happen to me when I heard this message. You can have your own conception of God. I'm like, that's blasphemy. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, what a relief. I felt like Alka-Seltzer. Oh, my gosh, I can have my own conception? But what does that mean? Right? That means that you get to have your own personal relationship, whatever you think this is, you get to have your own. And for years, I didn't know what that was because I was stuck in the old idea, you know, stuck back into what I was told this was. And so I had to have a new experience and I still have to have a new experience. So anyway, I'm drinking, I'm doing whatever I'm doing. I'm sleeping with this one and that one, waking up, don't know who's who and what's what. Don't, I can't even remember your name or why you're, but you know, look, we've all been there. So anyway, but I don't think I got a problem. I got no problem, right? I got nothing going on. There's no problem. Why don't I have a problem? Because I still have a job. I still have a car. I still have an apartment. I never had a DUI and I never got went to rehab. So I don't have a problem. I'm not like those alcoholics. You know, those alcoholics are those that are down at the Bowery or they're down at the train station with a bottle and a bag. That's them. Ah, that's not me. I'm not an alcoholic. So as the progression gets worse, I then start to use vodka and I get violent. And apparently I'm violent on vodka. So the great idea what my alcoholism says, well, instead of the vodka, why don't you try the beer? I'm like, that's a great idea. So I'm having the vodka. I'm blacking out. Apparently, I'm fighting with my girlfriend, and I, 
I remember I was that I came back to um, from one night and I came to and uh, her friend came knocking on the door. Big girl, big African American woman came to me. She says, "You ever put your hands on her again?" I'm gonna. I'm like, put my hands on her. I I don't know what you're talking about. I never did that. I would never do that. Well, in a blackout, I do a lot of things. So apparently, I was in a blackout. So anyway, long story short, I'm drinking, drinking, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know how to stop this. I don't know how to stop it. I'm drink, I'm buying the big bottles of wine. I'm dumping them down the sink. Then I go back to the liquor store to buy the big bottles of wine. Then I'm switching from all these different. De- I'm just trying everything. I'm hiding the liquor. I'm like to my cat, do you know where I put it? Because I can't remember, you know. And I'm just like, I'm nuts. I'm cuckoo for cocoa puffs, but I don't think I'm an alcoholic. Right. So one night, one day I'm on my couch from a, from a drunken stupor the night before. And I'm sitting there and all I heard, honestly, it's time. I don't know what said it, who said it, why I said it. I was like, it's time. It's time. And so that day I was like, OK, I'm like, right. We have always have great ideas like after a hangover. I'm never going to drink again. And then a couple hours later, when we start feeling better, we're like, oh, that was that's stupid. Huh? Not drink again. How crazy is that? So I go to work and I'm going to work. And then, of course, I, I'm heading to the gym after work because us alcoholics have to look good, even though we're a freaking mess. And uh, so I go to go to the, go to the gym and I'm in the car and I hear the voice again. It's time. So I call a friend of mine and I said, look, do you know where I can maybe find a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? I mean, honestly, guys, I don't remember anybody telling me about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know where that came from. You know, I don't. And and she said, there's a meeting at seven o'clock. This is how the disease works. Watch out for it. Think about what you're thinking about. Seven o'clock. I'm like, seven o'clock. Well, it's seven o'clock now. I can't go to that meeting. I'll be late. This is the disease talking. How dare you walk in that meeting late? Who do you think you are? This is what the the mind is telling me, right? And so now I've got the, what I truly feel today is the flesh and the spirit and they're fighting, right? Don't go to the meeting. Who do you think you are? Go to the meeting. So all the way there, the cuckoo for Cocoa Pops is going. I don't know who to believe. What the, the, I'm just going. So I'm sitting in the park lot. The, the voices are going. It won't shut up. It's chattering and crazy and call, you know, doing what it does. And I, and I, I was like, oh, screw it. All right. I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but I don't know why I'm here, but I got to go. So I go into the meeting and all of a sudden I don't see anybody. And I'm like, yes. And I go to turn around and all of a sudden the guy appears. He's like, excuse me, but do you have a desire not to drink today? I'm like, a desi- a de- yes, just for today, just right now. That's all I got is a desire. He's like, you're in the right place. If he would have said to me, excuse me, are you an alcoholic? You got a problem drinking? I would be like, see you later, guy. I go, bye. But he asked me, which was so powerful and so smart, do you have a desire not to drink for today, for right now, now? When When is this disease happening? Now, now, now. I have a desire not to drink now. In a second, it might change. And I stayed for that meeting. And I was like, this is really weird. Why? What? Wow, this is so weird. I'm, I'm listening. It's really weird. I'm comparing. You know, comparing is despairing. I don't know if anybody does that. They compare themselves to, the, to what they're hearing. And I'm comparing myself. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, man, these people are crazy. That one's got this going on. That one's got that going I'm not listening to the message. There's a message in here, and I wasn't listening. But for some reason, I kept coming because they said, keep coming. Keep coming back. And I would keep coming back. And then all of a sudden, I would hear these people talk, and i go, my God, they got the same thing I got. Their minds are they're just as crazy as I am. I thought I evaded 
depression and mental illness. I'm actually mental illness. I don't have depression. I thought I evaded it, to be honest with you. I was like, oh, great. I don't have depression like my mom. I don't lay in bed for hours on end. And my brother, well, I got a, unfortunately, I got two brothers that have um, bipolar. Thank God I don't have that. But when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, they said, you have a mind. And you have a disease. And it's, and it's, it, and it's in, the, in your mind. It starts with the thought. You're not good enough. You can't do this. You're ugly, or that one's better than you. They're be you're better than them. That's the disease of alcoholism. And so that's the mental illness. Why is it a mental illness? It's a mental illness because it separates me from a power that's greater than myself because now I'm in comparing and despairing when the mind takes off and I attach to the thought. If you ever think about it, Although you don't want to think, right? <laughs> think about what you're thinking about. The mind that talks to us in our own voice, and well, the mind that talks to me in my own voice, I don't know if you guys have this problem. I truly don't. The mind that talks to me in my own voice, I was listening to a speaker, and he's like, well, how are you, if that, if that mind is talking to you and you're hearing it, how is it you? I'm like, what? Yeah, you're not your thoughts. So all the thoughts that this mind is telling you are when you're good, bad, or indifferent, you're not them. You have to learn to detach from that, but you can't do it without a power greater than yourself. Well, how do you find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. It says it right here. Lack of power. That was my dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Can anybody go to an ocean right now and stop a wave? No. Can you make a tree be grown? No. Right? That's a power. But how do you find this power? As I said, I had always been seeking. And that's a beautiful thing about seeking. God wants you to seek. Seek and you shall find. And usually within yourself, you'll find the answer as long as you sit still and be still. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but this alcoholic can't sit still. I, if I sit still, what happens? My mind starts talking. And why do, they, why do you think Bill, he's so smart, this man, inspired by God, I truly believe it. He's like, in order to quiet the mind, what do you got to do? Prayer and meditation. Well, when I first told, when someone told me to meditate, I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Have you not heard this mind? It's constantly talking to me all the time. I can't meditate. So I went with my sponsor, right? Sponsorship, very important. I can't do this alone. If nobody has a sponsor and you're new, please get and use a sponsor. Uh, I could never do this alone. I just remember going to the, to the meditation and everybody's standing around and we're going to meditate for get this people 15 minutes i'm like 15 minutes fart nuts 15 minutes i'm like all right whatever i'm gonna have an open mind so i'm sitting there everybody's got their eyes shut and of course i got like one eye open i'm like nobody's freaking doing this for 15 minutes there's no way well they are they are you know and it takes practice right i didn't get sober the first day I came into AA, I mean, like, I didn't sober emotionally. Yes, you know, I, I got sober eventually. But, I mean, I remember for, for the first year, I was crazy. I was like, I, I really truly didn't believe I was an alcoholic. I was like, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not like them because I kept comparing and despairing. I never got a good DUI. I never got arrested. None of, blah, 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 none of that. But I would hear the message, and I would hear that this guy said, my, 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 my son, he committed suicide, and I'm not drinking my um i lost my job and i'm not drinking um my mom died and i'm not drinking and i'm like oh my gosh I, I i in the meeting i was like i'm hearing these things and i'm like oh my gosh god has me here for a reason something bad's gonna happen he's so, and then he's like yeah life is gonna happen and i'm gonna teach you how to handle it without drinking as long as you keep on coming you have an open mind and an open heart and you listen to what they have to say. Shut up, they used to say. Put the cotton in your ears. I mean, put the, take the cotton out of your ears and put them in your mouth, right? That's what they said. Just shut up. 
listen, you don't know nothing. I thought, I know everything. Don't you know I'm an alcoholic? I know it all. Any poop poop do. So all of a sudden, I am. Now I think I'm not an alcoholic. I've yet to I've yet to convince myself I'm an alcoholic. But I stopped coming to meetings. I just kept mo- I kept going, because something was happening here. I kept going. So one day I'm crying at my sponsor. Right? I'm crying, crying. Oh man, you cry so much in this room, especially when you get sober. I mean, maybe you don't, but I certainly did. <laughs> oh, I was crying. My poor baby. My poor best friend. I can't drink the best friend. I can't be with my best friend anymore. So anyway, I call my sponsor. She's like my pet temporary sponsor at the time. And I'm on my bicycle and I hear the music. I'm over here. I live in by the shore, man. I'm down by the shore. There's music going on all the time. There's clubs. There's whatever. I'm on my bike. I hear the music and I'm like, I call her up and I'm like, I want to go dance. And now mind you, mind you, I still have not been convinced that I'm an alcoholic. Right. And she's like, you don't want to go dancing. You want to go drinking. I'm like, oh, no, I'm a great dancer. And you would agree if you saw me. She's like, have you gone to a meeting yet? I was like, no. She said, get your ass to a meeting. Sponsorship, very important. Can't do this alone. I need someone to kick my ass and tell me to get get myself to a meeting, make me accountable, and help me through this book. Because I would have been looking at this book like a deer in headlights. Anyway. I go to the meeting. I'm like, all right, I'll go and do what she said. Because, you know, they say. Do what they say if you want what they want, what they have. So I go to the meeting and the guy is up at the podium and he says, if anybody ever told you that you can't drink milk again, would you cry? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm an alcoholic. I'm crying over alcohol. I'm crying that I can't have alcohol again. Never again. Ne- I, I can't. I'm an alcoholic. But see, that's the problem with this is that. No, I can't have alcohol right now. When now? When now? Because there's only now. There's only now. So I can't have it right now. And so I started to get that. Okay, right now. I can't have it. Maybe I'll have it tomorrow. Okay, I'll have it tomorrow. And that that started to work. I'll have it tomorrow. And I'll have it tomorrow. And then I would start talking to people. And I would start building a network. And I'd start building a network of women, man. Strong, sober women. I was like, look, I'm gay, but I don't like women. All right? I don't like them. So how was I going to build this network of women? But I just kept coming. I kept coming, and, 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 and people would help me when I felt lost and not, and, and when I was crying on steps, you know? And now I want to talk about, um, you know, Bill Wilson, forgive me for the not being correct. And I think someone might know this. I think maybe Janessa might know this. He had like 21 years, I want to say 21 years or 23 years when he's like, he almost had a breakdown. He almost, he almost Basically, the way they ver- word it is he almost was at the deep end where he was going to kill himself. 20-some-odd years sobriety. I don't know, guys, but here in New Jersey, somebody just committed suicide 30 years sober. 30. Okay? It's a mind power disease. And if I'm not in the power of, of my higher power, I'm on my own power and self-sufficiency is going to fail me. And I have to stay connected to whatever I think that power is. Now, that power in that get day may be calling my sponsor, maybe going to another meeting, maybe having a network. But, but within all of that, if I don't build my own personal relationship with the power, because there's going to be one day my sponsor is not going to pick up, there's going to be one day my friends are not around. There's going to be one day I might, it might be in the middle of the night and I can't get to a meeting. And I got two choices, either go to God or go to the liquor store. So I have to build a relationship of my own understanding, whatever that is, so that I can come. God, can you help me? Right now, I want to drink so bad or my thinking is going crazy. I need your help. Can you help me? Can you help me? 
we realize step one, I am powerless over my thoughts. I'm powerless over the thought that comes in. I cannot stop that thought from coming in. I'm powerless over it. And my life is unmanageable. Every part of my life, I need a power greater than myself. But in the moment when that power happens and that thought comes in, and now I can either attach or detach, I have to ask God, God, can you help me detach from this thought? Make me know, help me realize I am not the thought. Please, can you help me? Right? I got to then come to believe in a power greater than myself. Second step, I got to come to believe in this. Whatever, with all my power, I got to believe that this power is going to help me if I keep calling on it, if I keep asking, if I keep in that moment, if I'm staying, staying, is staying in that. And then I have to turn my will and my life over to whatever that is. What do you mean, turn it over? How do I rightly relate myself in the moment that I'm in when the thought is going crazy and it's driving me nuts and it's my, I have no desire, people. I have no desire to drink, but I have a problem with thinking. That's my problem today, thinking, not drinking. So in the moment when that th thought comes in, just like it did, you're not going to be able to do this meeting. 50 minutes? How are you going to talk for 50 minutes? You don't know nothing. God, can you help me? Can you help me? And turn. Sometimes I have to physically turn and ask for help and feel like because I, I need that. It says here, again, lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. If you've never been in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book, you know, people, I can't just go to meetings. I don't know about you. I'm just, I, meetings are not just going to do it for me. I have to be in the book, in the work. I have to be reading it on a daily basis. It says it's, in the beginning of this book, it tells us it's a basic text, and basic texts are meant to be studied. They're just not, it's not one and done. No, I need to continue to read this because then I'll read. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Solve your problem. That means, oh gosh, hold on to your horses, people. That means we've written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And guess what happens? And it means, of course, that we are going to talk about God. Woo! Who wants to talk about God? Especially the way I was brought up. I don't want to hear nothing about no God. And that's what I realized today. And this is only my opinion. You can take what you want. When people hear the word God and they can't stand it, they've had a bad experience with it. Someone told them about this God the way that they believed that that God was. And unfortunately, they believed the person that told them. And then therefore, when they hear the word God, they've got it. They cringe. Because they don't have their own relationship to whatever that power is, whatever that word God is. What do they say? Group of drunks? How is it that we all get together, we sit in this room, we listen to everybody talking, and we say, I can relate to what she just said. I can relate to a 90-year-old man or, or a 17-year-old girl. How is that possible? We all have the same problem. We have a disease that centers in our mind. And we all need each other. It's a we program, not a me program. But I'll tell you what I used to do. When I would see the word we, I'd cross it out and put me because it's all about me. What about me? What about me? It's always about me. And that's what I realize about this disease. It tells us we are self-centered, self-centered. And it says when these things crop up, what things? Dishonesty, fear, anger, worry. When these things crop up, we have to go to a power. So it says we're going to talk about God. Here, difficulty arises with agnostics. Many times we talk to a new man and watch his hope rise as we discuss his alcoholic problems and explain our fellowship, but his face falls when we speak of spiritual matters, especially when we mention God. Right? 
that poor God, I'm going to write a book. It's going to say, God gets a bad rap. Everybody blames God about everything. Oh, God did this and God did that. We never take accountability. I never even took accountability for my own actions. I'm like, me? It says, you know, that <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I treated people terribly. I did. I used them. And because I was so insecure, I told them I loved them. I didn't even know what that was. I would, I would do what I would, I would pretend to be what they wanted me to be because I had no idea who I was. I was a liar. You know, I was dishonest. It says here, if we're going to get sober, one of the hardest things to do is be rigorously honest. What does that mean? That means that if I'm going to sit down with a sponsor, that I'm going to trust that person. I have to trust that person that I can tell them my darkest, darkest, dark, I'm talking dark secret. I have to get rigorously honest. And if I don't feel like I can say it to that sponsor, I got to find a sponsor that I feel like I can say it to. Because I got to be rigorously honest. If I don't, I'm not, I'm going to pick up a drink. I'm going to pick up a drink. It's going to happen. Right. If I don't get rigorously honest, if I don't keep going to meetings, if I don't start reaching out my hand, if I don't do service, if I don't um, tell somebody how I'm feeling. Look, I got 13 years sober, man. And a couple of weeks ago, I said to myself, I can see why people kill themselves. Because the mind is powerful. But there is one who has all power. And that one is God. God, I'm going to say right here, forget pointing. God's not like up there or over there in the in my little red wagon. God's right here. Right here. And we all have it. You know why we all have it? Because, man, when I sit in the room and I hear you guys, all of a sudden you're saying something. I'm just like, wow, I, I can totally relate to that person. That's the power. Wow. It's so... You know, we had uh, for, so for we have op we opened the subject which but which our man and woman thought she had neatly or he had neatly evaded entirely or ignored. You know, we now we know how he feels. We have shared his honest doubt and prejudice. Some of us have been violently anti-religious. Anybody been violently anti-religious? You know, I grew up my father. Just a couple weeks ago, I went down to my dad's, and he says, Poppy, asking me about my personal belief. And I was like, Dad, I just don't believe that. He's like, oh, you're possessed by the devil. I, what? I was like, see you. Got to go. Because this, pro this program taught me that I have to get high have boundaries, and I can actually leave. I don't have to listen to stuff like that. I can actually have my own personal relationship and nobody can tell me what that relationship is. Now, if I, my relationship with that power is having me kill people, having me steal, having me rot, well, of course, I, that's, come on, man. That's not what I'm saying here. You know, I don't know about you, but anyway, so I'm sober now, right? I am, I am yep, I'm sober. I get it. All right. The milk, the beer, the, uh, I'm an alcoholic. So now that I'm sober, I'm going to let everybody know how sober I am because that's how great I am, right? Because I'm in AA and everybody's got to know it and everybody should go because I'm going. So I go to the super supermarket and this guy doesn't put his cart back and I am sober. So I'm going to tell him that he should put the cart back. He says, excuse me. He goes, excuse me, sir, because I'm alcoholic and I'm sober. You didn't put the cart back. He goes, who the F do you think you are? And I'm like, I'm sober. I'm, what? And he's cursing at me. And I'm like, what the? Who? That's just wrong. And I can't wait to get to my meeting to tell everybody about this guy that I told to put the cart back and how he treated me. So I raise my hand. I tell him. At the end of the meeting, some old timer. These old timers are the best, man. Get with the old timers, the new timers. Get with them any timer. Get get with them. Hang out with them. Old timer comes up and he goes, "You know what you should have done." And I couldn't wait in anticipation. I'm like, "What? 
He said, you should have put the cart back yourself. What? That's what we talk about, being on our side of the street. I can't tell you what to go and do. What about my side of the street? Oh, when I heard that, when I sponsor said, doesn't matter what they did. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, they did this and they did that and they did this. She's like, you did it all because it's always miseries of your own making. Always miseries of my own making. I get involved in a relationship I don't want to be in and we're breaking up. And I'm like, what's going on? Why are we breaking up? You didn't want to be in the freaking relationship in the first place. Miseries of your own damn making. Oh, my gosh. This cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs disease, man. Sometimes I just got to laugh at it. Because I'm I just like, oh, wow, this is some crazy stuff. Emotional sobriety is where I want to live today. When I read about the hole in the donut, that what will become of us will become like the hole in the donut. I was like, I don't want to do this. That means I got to do the next right thing. And that means I got to be like praying and meditating. I got to do all that. Guess what? Today, I want to be the hole in the donut. I want to be a piece right here, man. A piece that surpasses all understanding. I need that peace. And I only get it through prayer, meditation, and service. Prayer, meditation, service. Prayer, meditation, service. Prayer, meditation, service. Talk about service when I first got into AA, all of a sudden, because I don't know, something inside me. We all got that little something inside us, right? Well, especially when we got AA, when we have AA, when we've come to AA, when we're doing the work, when we when we when that desire has lifted to drink, and we're really, really in it, all of a sudden something changes, right? We have been transformed. Something changes. The doctor, you know, Silk didn't even recognize some of the people. He was like, he couldn't even recognize the transformation. And that's what happens to us, right? Each one of us have that moment of clarity. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I shouldn't send that email. Maybe I shouldn't act that, that angrily. Maybe I shouldn't. That is the power that's helping us. And if I listen, that power is available a lot. And sometimes, I, like I said, I got to be quiet, be still, and know that I am. And I'm like, yeah, I got to be still. I need to help. Can you help me be quiet? Can you help me not send that email to my coworker about what a jerk I think they are? Can you humble me? Can you help me make an amends? I don't know what the power is. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how it works. I don't know. And I'm grateful for that today. Because for so many years, I'm going to cry. I wanted to know. What did it look like? Does it have a beard? Is it up in the sky? Does it, you know, does it wear a long coat? Is it on a cross? Did it resurrect? What is that power? That power is when, the, when, when, for now, for today, when, now, now, can you help me? Because lack of power is my dilemma, and I need help. I need help. I don't know, is that 50 minutes? Do we think we're good here, or what do you think, people? Is, does anybody know how long I've been talking? Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I keep going. Well, listen. Look, if you, like I said, I mean, again, sponsorship is important, right? Now, I want to read something. This so this book is unbelievable. It's so unbelievable. It says here, this is on page forty-seven of the big book. Anybody got the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? If you don't, please pick it up. I hope. I think you guys sell it there. No, maybe. Not sure. Maybe you give it away. It says page forty-seven. We need to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I willing to believe? Am I willing 
to believe there's a power greater than myself. Are you willing? I pretty much think that 67 people here are willing because they're here at nine o'clock on a, it's a Saturday there, right? Saturday, I was in the, you guys call it the pub. We call it the bar. I was in the bar at Saturday. No, I was in no freaking meeting. Now I know. So again, you know, am, am I now, do I believe and am I willing to believe there's a power greater than myself? And, and, and don't, it says here, don't, um, don't worry about whether the chicken or the egg came first. That's what I do. Like I'm worried about, uh, Power, okay, God, it was, it's uh, the whole Adam and Eve thing, man. I'm just like, I don't understand the whole Adam and Eve thing. You mean to tell me that there's an Adam and there's an Eve, and Eve went to go eat, eat some apple. And and then all of a sudden, we're all like, where we are. I'm like, why, what? Why, why is it Eve anyway? Why can't it be Adam? Just asking. But this is where my mind goes, because I need to have my own personal relationship with God. So I wanted to share here again, as soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderful, wonderful, effective, effective spiritual structure can be built. Now, if you go to what a spiritual experience is, this is good. It's Bill Wilson. He was something. They were both Bob and Bill. They were amazing. Page 567. I'm going to read the spiritual experience. The term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading shows that the personality change, personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. That means the way that I recovered is not the same way you recover. My relationship with God is not as what your relationship may be, God. Many forms, right? Yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in a natural, a natural of nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. So people would read this and they'd be like, you mean to me, I gotta have like this sudden, like a white light happen to me? What if I don't get that? What's gonna happen? So they said, um, happily for everyone, this is this conclusion is erroneous. It doesn't have to happen like it happened for Bill Wilson. It doesn't have to happen like it happened for me. It could happen suddenly or it can happen slowly. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. It will always materialize if we work for it. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described. Though it was not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, recover. That's in here many, many times, this word recover. Okay, in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God conscious, followed by at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing re- membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. No means does it have to happen to you that way. So don't compare because you'll be despairing and you'll walk out of here and you'll pick up a drink and you may die. Because this disease is no no bull. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of this difference long before he himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life my mom died seven years ago, man, didn't pick up a drink. I lost my job a couple of times, didn't pick up a drink. Lost a seven-year relationship, didn't pick up a drink. That's a change, right? I don't beat people up today, although I'd like to hit them sometimes. 
being real. Okay. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life. That such change could hardly have been brought on by himself alone. What did it? A power. What power? Wasn't his power. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource. Where did I tell you it came from? It's not, it's not out there. It's not out there with a it's not out there with a car, with a boat, with a you know, new clothes and new shoes and no more money in the bank. It's not out there. Go ahead and get all that stuff. That's a blessing, but that's not the answer. Inner words, which will, which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves, their own conception. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of a spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic, any, capable of honestly facing his problem in the light of our experience can what what recover we can do what recover we can recover if you're new you're struggling you can recover if you're old struggling you can recover if right now your your, your mind is everywhere else but here you can recover Provided he does not close his mind to a spiritual concept, he can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one need have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery. But these are indispensable. There is a principle which is a bar against all information which is proof against all arguments and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that proof is contempt prior to investigation. I'm like, I'm not going to A. That stuff don't work. What? I didn't even try it. You ever, like, you ever go out to somebody like, I'm not going to try that. I don't like it. I'm like, did you ever freaking eat it? No. Well, how do you know? It's the same with the book. It's the same with the program. If you don't work it, and if you think that working it is, I did, I went for a week or a month. This thing don't work. You know, maybe I went for a year. It doesn't work. You got to work it. And what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what that means. That means dig down deep, uncover, discover, discard. That's where the inventory comes from. I can, I found out a whole bunch about myself. I never thought that I was, uh, you know, I was dishonest. I thought I was so, my mom used to say, you're the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because I would tell her, mom, I smoked pot today. Or mom, I haven't had sex yet. And she'd be like, stop telling me stuff, you know. But I would lie to people, tell them I love them, I like them, I want them in my life. I mean, just a liar. Just, just a liar, pants on fire. You know. But I have seen many people die of this disease, of alcoholism. I truly didn't believe it could happen. But I have seen many die from 30 years of sobriety to very few days of sobriety. Because in between all of that is the fault-finding mind, never satisfied, always in a hurry, alcoholism. And look, if you're struggling and you got a lot of years, tell somebody. If you're struggling and you got one day, tell somebody. You know, if you're struggling, talk. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Don't be ashamed. We've all been there. We've all been there. That's got to be 50 minutes by now. Anyway, no, I, I do really, truly bless you all. And, and, you know, may God keep you and bless you until then. Thank you for letting me share.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.